Hello and welcome to, oh, what is this, lecture number 15 for Cognitive Neuroscience. We're continuing our track through research methods. Um, we will be discussing electrical activity in the brain and how it's measured in today's lecture. Uh, following this, we will get into functional neural imaging and then we will finally be done with research methods. There's two more after this. Uh, introduction to functional neural imaging and then another lecture on PET scans and uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. But today we're talking about measuring electrical activity in the brain. Um, so we'll start with some what we refer to as invasive techniques. Um, generally uh, these are techniques that are conducted in animals or individuals undergoing brain surgery. These would not be techniques used in healthy individuals who are not uh, undergoing surgery because we don't, you know, routinely want to open up somebody's skull. It's obviously a very dangerous procedure and only would do that in the case of somebody who was undergoing surgery and then agrees to participate in research as part of that. We'll then talk about non-invasive techniques. Um, these include Two uh, closely related techniques that use the same equipment, electroencephalography and event-related potentials. And then we'll finish up with um, a more advanced version of this called magnetoencephalography. The first thing we have to remember about all of this is the brain functions via uh, the firing of action potentials, which are, of course, electrical signals generated um, by uh, neurons themselves. So in single cell recordings, we have electrodes that are inserted into the brain uh, to measure patterns of neural firing, and these are placed uh, alongside of a single neuron. Now, unfortunately, we can't be sure that the uh, neuron is firing. Uh, we're getting the electrical signal from a single neuron. Oftentimes, we're getting multiple neurons firing all together uh, or in um, units, and so something we have to watch out for. You can insert um, electrodes into a single neuron, but generally that just causes too much damage to the neuron itself, and so we usually uh, place these alongside of a neuron. So the goal here is to measure that single neuron, but as I said, measuring a small of group, group of nearby neurons is certainly something that is likely. Um, fortunately, we have computers. Computers do amazing things, and they can sort patterns um, of firing into uh, individual neurons. So that is, they can identify the pattern of functioning um, from a single neuron based um, primarily on the amplitude of the signals, uh, which allows it to determine which ones are very nearby and which ones are further away. So the closest neuron is going to have the highest amplitude. So the primary measure um, here in this particular type of technology is the firing rate of a neuron, and this is going to become very important when we move into talking about uh, visual perception, because this is a huge part of how we study visual perception. So um, over here on the right, we have two parts of uh, the results we might get from single star recordings. The top is what we we'll refer to as a raster plot. So each um, of these rows is uh, a single trial, and then as we uh, and we time lock these two events, so we record for a period of time. Let's say we shine a light um, on a specific part of the retina, and that's one of the things we'll talk about when we get to um, <sighs> visual perception. Sorry. In this case, um, we have um, a basic learning trial which you would use in a rat or monkey or pigeon in which you provide a cue, light comes on, they then get a reward following that um, basic conditioning process and then you can watch the firing of neurons in this entire process. Um, we can then take that raster plot and turn it into what's called a parastimulus histogram and essentially what this is is we've added up all of the times that neuron has fired at this particular point. And so we can see the firing has occurred more at this point in time, that is here at negative two and a half seconds prior to the reward, um, compared to other points. And in that fact, this particular neuron has not fired much at all after the reward. And so something with this neuron is involved in anticipating that reward that's related to the cue. We get a spike following the cue. 
uh, then continuous burst after that, um, following that. There it would appear to me, um, based on my inexpert opinion, because signals are recording something I've never been involved with personally, but I've certainly read a great deal of research about it, it would appear to me that this is a refractory period from this neuron uh, following this major burst of activity that's being picked up on this parastimulus histogram. So we'll talk a great deal about firing rates. Sometimes these are also just simply a line with tick marks on them, because that's the old school way we used to do this. Um, and so you'll see some of those plots when we get into talking about uh, visual perception. Uh, the other thing we can do here is electrocorticography. So here we have a series of electrodes that are placed on the surface of the exposed brain. Uh, so they're placed directly on the cortex. Measurement is then based on populations of neurons. So basically we're measuring uh, groups of neurons firing all at once. Um, when we measure electrical activity in the brain, we're never, or very rarely I should say, there is a technique we won't talk much about called EROS, which is event-related optical signaling, which can actually measure neuron by neuron. Uh, and some other, uh, we're getting to the point where we can do this with MRI units, uh, where we can actually track individual neurons firing. But uh, for uh, humans, most of the time, uh, most of the research we'll be talking about is a whole bunch of neurons firing all at once. And so that's what's happening here uh, with these um, maps with electrocorticography. We place electrodes on the map and then stimuli are presented. I think previously I talked about um, a recent uh, case where an individual played her violin while um, her skull was open so that they could sort of determine what uh, parts of the brain were responsible for that. They probably did this electrocorticography so they could measure everything that was critical to that functioning because she didn't want to lose any of that functioning. Um, we get very precise uh, spatial resolution with this technique and temporal resolution. Unfortunately, we of course have very limited access to this because we can't, um, we can't always rely on participants. And of course, these aren't by their very nature because they're having to undergo neurosurgery, not always uh, quote unquote normal patients. So they have some sort of injury, um, epilepsy or other brain injury that we are trying to treat with this kind of procedure. Now, that being said, um, we can um, take these measurements and present them as what's called an electrocorticogram, which shows both an amplitude, which is basically the power of this neuronal firing, because remember we're talking about groups of neurons, and the more groups of neurons there are, the more power there is to them, and the frequency of neural signals, which are often divided into bands. So we have these frequencies of neural signals, um, so delta waves or delta frequencies are 1 to 4 hertz or 1 to 4 times per second. Theta, 4 to 8 hertz. Alpha, 7.5 to 12.5 hertz. Beta, 13 to, thir 13 to 30 hertz. You can see these overlap a little bit. Don't shoot the messenger. This is just how it's done. If it looks like people are making this up as they go along, <laughs> sometimes they are. Uh, and these are grouped uh, based loosely around some observations about um, properties of the brain. And so there's a functional reason for this, and there's some reason for some overlap, uh, but we'll get into that. Um, so then we get to gamma, um, which are 30 to 70 hertz, and then high gamma are greater than 70, 70 hertz, so faster than 70 times per second. So those are these bands. Now we can then sort of take this and turn it into this electrocorticogram. So here we have um, uh, across the x-axis, we have uh, time, so I assume uh, post-stimulus, so we have some sort of stimulus, let's say um, we present um, a word, something like that, um, that the person hears. And then we can see, um, based on the color of the plot, the amplitude of the uh, particular wave uh, or electrical activity, so we have high amplitude activity in the higher frequency range, so this would be in that high gamma range um, up here, because you can see on the y-axis that frequency is um, part of that. And then if you look over in the right area here, over about 1,000 milliseconds, we get um, a pretty high amplitude occurrence in the, what is that, beta range. So depending on the time frame, we get different bursts of activity, 
at different frequencies. So those are some invasive techniques. Um, what we're about to talk about are the most common of the um, electrical activity recordings. Uh, EEG and event related potentials are, um, I think without a question, uh, the most common cognitive neuroscience technique we will look at throughout the semester. A lot of press is given to MRI, fMRI studies, and there is a lot of that being done. But ERP is uh, done quite a bit. And in fact, uh, when I was a graduate student, our undergraduate students did an entire um, project using event-related potentials um, because the equipment is dirt cheap from a research perspective. I mean, a top-of-the-line 256-channel EEG ERP system, um, you know, 100,000 maybe. Um, I actually honestly haven't shot for one in a while. They're probably cheaper than that now. Um, whereas magnetoencephalography we're going to talk about is in the, you know, tens of millions of dollar range. So these are very different kinds of techniques. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit as we go through this uh, about the cost because it's an important consideration. So here we have electroencephalography. Uh, we have from 20 to 256 electrodes placed on the scalp. And these electrodes record signals from the cortex and subcortex. Now remember, these electrical signals have to travel um, through the brain tissue, through the meninges, through the skull, through the scalp, um, before we can actually read them. So we have reference electrodes, and we also have um, the actual measurement electrodes, because remember, we're, uh, remember how electricity works. It's usually talking about a circuit, so we are measuring the difference between those um, reference uh, electrodes. The denser these arrays are, the better uh, the better they are, and the better we are at trying to determine where in the brain something might be coming from. Um, and certainly nothing less than, I would say, 128. These usually are in uh, arrays of uh, factors of 8, so 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and 256 tend to be uh, the general arrays involved. Um, and then a 256 electrode um, system, you can combine uh, the electrodes together uh, and uh, sort of use those as a single unit of analysis, just average across those electrodes. Anyway, um, so electroencephalography is really great for monitoring various states of the brain. So, for example, sleep, all of you have taken an intro psych, I'm assuming. And um, during sleep, we can sort of monitor those sleep waves and measure those states of the brain. But we can also measure um, other states. So we get increases in alpha power, which is associated, associated with reduced states of attention. So if your attention is reduced, like many of ours are during this sort of troubling time. Um, and so we get reduced states of attention with those reductions in alpha power, and that's something we can then investigate, and we can also determine whether or not somebody might be lapsing in attention based on their alpha waves. Uh, increases in theta waves are associated with cognitive engagement, and so if somebody is, for example, uh, trying to conduct a task and their theta wave uh, activity is low, that might indicate some sort of injury or damage. And so this can also be used as a diagnostic tool. So this is essentially what the system kind of looks like. This all plugs then into uh, an amplifier, uh, which boosts those signals. Uh, that amplifier will also do things like uh, filter out other electrical signal signals. So for example, there's a notch filter. I think it's at 60 hertz, um, which is the frequency of alternating current. Um, so any electrical outlets, plugs, laptops, that sort of thing, uh, the noise from those electrical signals will be reduced. Now this does, from a, a um, research perspective, require the individual to sit relatively still um, because we're trying to measure neural firing within the brain and when you do something like blink, that electrical signal is gigantic. Um, and in fact, one of the things we do when we do this research is we ask people to blink while they're um, waves are on the screen so they can see how huge those uh, waves are because uh, muscles have a huge electrical signal associated with them relative to the neural signaling of uh, neurons deep in the brain. Also, 
of the nerves that are controlling those muscles are right on the surface. And so when that nerve fires, it's a big old giant electrical signal compared to the rest. Okay, so here's essentially some of those kind of sleep spindles you might recall. And we have somebody who's excited, relaxed, drowsy, asleep, deeply asleep. Now this is where we can determine if somebody might be in coma because of very, very slow waves. And so we can actually look at the oscillations of these brain waves and see if we're talking about, you know, um, high gamma versus alpha waves, etc. One of the other things I want to talk briefly about with EEG is there is a standard system for electrode placement and numbering. Uh, these caps you see right here make that much easier um, because basically you have to find uh, a couple of bone reference points um, and make sure the reference electrodes are on those bones or relatively easily, the top of your jawbone, etc. cetera, and there, um, one behind your ear. Uh, and so we just make sure those are placed correctly and then everything else is relatively, as long as it's the right size cap, um, uh, are all automatically placed. So this is sort of essentially all done already. Back in the old days, we used to have to, old days, you know, the old days 20 years ago, um, when I was in graduate school, we had caps that were a little bit different from these. Um, they were not as sensitive. They also, this is usually you squirt um, some, a fluid underneath these is sort of a EEG gel. Um, and that um, helps that conduct, conductivity. Conducti yeah, conductivity. Um, these systems are all a little bit different. Some of them are um, uh, involve things like salt water um, to improve uh, conductivity. But it used to be we, have, we would have to go in, place these on individual spots on the scalp. We'd actually have to sort of move hair around to try to make sure we got as close to the scalp as possible. Um, so this is much, much easier. So these systems, uh, as you can see here, and there's a really great um, new article, relatively new article, just a couple of years old, in clinical neuropsychology talking about this standardized EEG electrode array. Um, and it, it makes relatively close sense. Odd numbers are on the left, even numbers are on the right. Um, and then the letters in front, um, you might be able to see a reference uh, generally where these things are. So F is for frontal, um, and then there's front central, and then there's central. Um, so CZ is essentially right at the top in the middle of your head. Uh, so Z stands for, also stands for midline. C stands for center, uh, from ear to ear. And then T stands for temporal, so you see FT, these are frontotemporal. And then we have AF, and these are anterior, fr uh, anterior frontal. Then we have uh, parietal, temporal parietal, central parietal, and occipital lobe. And in general, these, and then parietal, occipital, in general, these have to do with uh, which lobe they're supposed to be over. Pretty straightforward. So that's EEG, uh, and a little bit about that equipment. Now, event-related potentials use the exact same equipment, only we time lock uh, the electrical activity to specific external events. So EEG is a state measure. It's not used to measure what's happening um, to a specific stimulus. It's used to measure sort of your overall state. Are you awake? Are you sleepy? Um, et cetera. And that's why it's used in things like sleep studies. It's also used in epilepsy studies. Um, the technology now is to the point where you can um, wear EEG around and basically almost like a baseball cap that's tied in uh, to a unit about the size of your phone. They're simple, they're only a few electrodes. Um, but they can sort of monitor your state over time. Um, so it's much uh, easier um, on the patient so they're not having to sort of hang around and wait to have a seizure, but they can actually get some of that recording done. Anyway, ERPs are involved in uh, time locking these electrical signals to specific external events. So we have, um, basically we've just added another computer. We have one computer that's processing the EEG signal, going to the amplifier, then to our computer. And let's say in this case, this is an auditory evoked potential. We generate a sound. We have stimulus onset and we record the brain activity um, for that particular trial. You can see uh, because there's a lot going on. This is pretty rough. Uh, 
And also the scale on these two um, graphs is off by magnitude of 10. And so what this EEG measure is, is it's everything that's happening. All the things that are going on at once, your breathing, you're daydreaming about going to vacation in Bermuda or you know, getting out of the house someday or what you're going to have for lunch or what you had for lunch. Um, there's a lot going on in your brain that has nothing to do with what we're interested in. And we're just interested in how the brain responds to this auditory signal. So we do this a bunch of times. So we might do this, say, a hundred times. And over the time, we get then an average signal. So all that noise is going to average out. So essentially we're looking for a signal, that signal associated with that auditory response. And so this is what we refer to as a signal to noise ratio problem. The more trials you have, the greater your signal is going to be, the better your processing ability, the more electrodes you have, and the less your subject fidgets and blinks and does other things, the less noise there's going to be. And so we can eventually then end up with this nice ERP waveform that you can see is 2 microvolts instead of 20 microvolts or millivolts. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Anyway, um, so what you can see is we get the stimulus onset of that particular sound. We get at this particular electrode site sometime later a little negative um, I'm sorry, positive, this one's upside down. Um, positive deflection is down in this graph, and then negative deflection is up. So this would be what's called a P1. This would be an N1 or N2. This would be a P3. This is the first, second, third component. This is where things start to get slightly confusing, and we're getting into that next. Anyway, over time, we average, and we get a nice signal-to-noise ratio. So, um, and what we're interested in is... If you remember from, uh, oh, we haven't talked about fMRI yet, but in fMRI we're going to talk about uh, what's called the subtractive method. And there we subtract that neural noise from uh, our signal. But here we're just averaging out over time. So the assumption is every time we do this, you're going to breathe out on one trial, breathe out on another, you're going to fidget one way or the other, one you're going to be vacationing in Bermuda, one you're going to be vacationing in veil it's hard to say so all of that noise all that noise that's going on in your head that's going to get uh it's just going to simply average out to zero and so eventually we're just left with the signal we're interested in so one of the things we have to do then is look at the individual components of the ways if we start trying to identify specific neural signals associated with specific events and here's where things get very strange um so we have positive and negative components. And the first thing you have to understand about event-related potential research is some people put positive up, because it makes sense. Some people put positive down. That is, the downward deflection is actually indicating positive, because that's how the equipment that was built in the 1950s generated signals. Um, <laughs> and literally, that's exactly the reason why these are up versus down. And so you have to look very carefully at what's positive versus what's negative. So in this particular um, example over here, uh, positive is up, negative is down, which makes me happy. Um, this is using what's called a go no-go task, very common ERP task. Uh, I'm going to try for my students in my Cognero class to find you um, some sort of behavioral analog you can just at least get a chance to experience. So here you can see if you look in the upper left hand quadrant here in the go, um, right out here we have um, a little negative deflection that would be an N1 for order of component. This would be an N2 because it's the second negative component. Here we have P2, or right, that's this? Sorry, P3. And here's the thing that oftentimes gets confusing is what they consider a component and not a component. So this would be maybe a P1 and an N2, and this would be P3. 
Um, so here we have another P3. P3, uh, N2 and P3 are two components you see a lot of discussion of in the attention literature, which is what this study is about. And so here you can see the differences between ADHD and control patients in their P3 component, which is of interest. And then the N2 component we see no difference in this no-go task. And the N2 component is actually indicative of inhibiting um, of an inhibitory ta of inhibiting a response, as I think is the P3. Um, it's been a while since I dug into this literature, so don't hold me to any of that. Um, but basically, it's the ordering of the components, what order the wave is in, and uh, where it occurs. The other way this is done is by time of onset. So, and these are not on this particular component, uh, particular part. So, this is probably what we would call an N100 because it's at about 100 milliseconds. This is probably also a P300 because for whatever reason, the third wave component and the 300 millisecond occurs right around the 300 millisecond mark. So this would probably be, about a, be the P300 as well. Oftentimes, mathematically, in order to try to determine if there's a significant difference in this P300 or P3 component, um, we would average across um, a certain range of milliseconds following the stimulus onset. One of the things to keep in mind about EEG data is there's a lot of it. Um, so, for example, in my dissertation, which we're going to look at that data here in a minute, each trial included 1,500 data points because the computer cycles every one, every one millisecond. So you get 1,000 data points per second per electrode per trial. So in uh, my case, we had... 32 electrodes, so for each time a participant uh, saw a word on the screen and was trying to decide whether or not they could remember it, whether it was presented earlier, for uh, each of those individual trials, there were 4,800 data points. Um, and then that was across, I think, 144 trials across um, yeah it was a lot of data points it, it's turned out to be something in the millions of data points so in order to deal with that mathematically oftentimes we'll average across components um, and these are average waves these are averaged across participants and across many trials um, but then in order to try to do some statistics you would then collapse across a, a portion of this wave at a particular um, electrode location to try to determine whether or not there's a significant difference. A lot of this data requires very advanced statistics that are beyond the scope of this particular course, but you should look into that if there's something you're interested in doing. So to summarize here, the uh, components are identified as P or N if they're positive or negative. It's the easy part. Time of onset, also easy. Um, so if it's onset around 100 millisecond, it would be the N100, N200, the P300. Um, most cognitive events unfold very quickly, so we don't really usually get much uh, past 500 milliseconds in terms of our examination of that. And then the order of the component, well, first, second, third, etc. So to give you an idea about how we might look at these, uh, this is from uh, a study uh, I pulled out of, I think this is out of an intro psych test textbook that was written by Mike Kazaniga, the same author of the cognitive neuroscience textbook I use for this course. And here we have several electrode sites. Um, uh, positive is up, negative is down. And here we're comparing um, words, non-words, and pseudo-words. So what's happening is at stimulus onset, word is presented on the screen. Then we start tracking um, very rapidly from that time onward in terms of uh, differences in electrical activity. Well, you can see right away, non-words the brain behaves very differently to the presence of non-words than it does to words and pseudo-words. Words and pseudo-words, we have to look to try to figure out where we see a difference. This is kind of really how, the, this is honestly how this is done. We start looking and then we go and try to test statistics. Oftentimes, uh, we do have a hypothesis about where something might be occurring. So for example, we would expect something in the language areas, for example, or word recognition areas. So here you can see 
that it emerges much later than the non-words versus words and pseudo-words components. And uh, so you can see out here, these ticks is probably 100 milliseconds. So I added about 300 milliseconds or so. Uh, we're starting to finally get some kind of difference here at C3. You can kind of see it at C4 and TP8, uh, or we can start seeing some of this difference. What's great about this technique is it provides really precise temporal resolution. That is, we can see how these things unfold in a millisecond by millisecond basis. So this is from my dissertation. If you are just dying to read it, you can find it <laughs> online. I know it's, I wouldn't read it. Um, <laughs> Uh, really, it's a great study. Um, it has been cited a few times. Um, what we were doing is we were interested in uh, looking at uh, people and whether or not their memories had a specific um, sensory component. In particular, we were talking about what's called false recognition. So this is what the D. schrodinger mcdermott paradigm is about. So what you're seeing here is across four different conditions, or it's basically four different conditions, um, Half the participants heard words on the study list, so the words were read out loud, so they're trying to remember an auditory event. Half the participants saw words, so they're trying to remember a visual event. And then the two different item types are lure items, that is ones that they are falsely recognizing, and hits are items they are correctly recognizing. What you can first see uh, very dramatically is a significant difference in the electrical activity in the brain associated with trying to remember something that was seen versus heard. And then you can see as we get out a little bit further on, we start to see um, higher levels of activity for trying to remember, determine whether or not a lure item or a f an item that was not presented, but that they identified as having been presented. There's a lot uh, greater amplitude of activity. So pretty interesting stuff, I thought. Um, I wrote it very quickly, um, so I wouldn't say it's my best work, but certainly, certainly of interest. And there's lots more, lots more, there's lots of more better research. Speaking of not writing well, um, that you can look at. All right, so we're time locking uh, to events. We're then looking at components after we have signal uh, averaged over signals, and then finally, I just want to note that there are some sort of specialized. Um, EEG signals, or sorry, ERP signals that we look at, auditory evoked potentials and visually evoked potentials um, are just what they sound like. So auditory evoked potentials are um, those that occur because of a sound. Visually evoked potentials are those that occur because of vision. These are diagnostic techniques oftentimes used to determine, for example, if an individual has an, a, a functioning cochlea, um, if they're having hearing difficulty, we can test whether or not they have nerve damage, and then visually evoked potentials um, are determining whether or not uh, the visual system is working as it's supposed to. That gets us to magnetoencephalography, and this won't take uh, very long. This is a not very new technique. It's just, it's not, it's you can use a lot more, um, but it certainly is not one uh, that uh, has been used a great deal compared to ERP because the equipment is so expensive. So we're again measuring electrical activity, but by detecting the magnetic fields that that electrical activity is generating. So every time neurons fire, uh, every time an electrical signal is generated, uh, a uh, magnetic field is generated as well. Some of you will remember um, making magnets um, in a science class or running an electrical current through a needle and creating a compass um, by thereby magnetizing it, and essentially electrical generators function by using magnets. So mag uh, magnetic fields and electricity go hand in hand, um, and that's one of the reasons why there's so many conspiracy theories about things like 5G and living near power lines, etc. Um, so because of those strong magnetic fields, so measures that electrical activity um, generated by or magnetic fields generated by electrical activity. This requires a shielded room as well, although the shielding isn't required as much because the equipment's gotten better. It used to be you had to shield the room from uh, the Earth's magnetic field and everything else that's going on because we're trying to measure magnetic fluctuations that are 
orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude, lower than the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, they use these things that are called superconducting quantum interference devices, or SQUIDs. Um, so they have to be cooled um, with liquid helium. Um, MRI units have to be cooled with liquid helium as well. Um, and there's a, a shortage of helium in the world right now, which is a problem. And so there's lots of work being done to try to figure out how to do this without those particular techniques. Um, this is often used in combination with other techniques. Um, and the great thing about it is you don't have to have scalp electrodes. You can just stick your head in this unit. Uh, sometimes this would be used in combination with MRI, so a single unit that's both MEG and MRI, which is what's happening here, um, which gets us at uh, both structure and function in a way that's very precise um, and lots of power uh, to that particular technology. So coming up in our next set of lectures are going to be uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging and uh, other techniques. Very exciting advances in those areas. Um, we are now getting to the point where there are bedside MRI units that are being developed, so you don't have to stick your head in that giant um, tube of death. That's going to be in our next lecture. So thanks for tuning in, and uh, we will pick up next time with uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging and PET scans.